Thank, thank you very much for having me. Thank you guys for coming and uh, being with us today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, my role as a surgeon um, for the most part, and the reason why he, we're here together, Dr. Agopian and I, is I usually deal with the primary tumor, and, and we do surgery for the primary tumor often, and, and then Dr. Agopian usually helps us if the tumor has metastasized and there's additional surgery that needs to be done. So these are the objectives uh, today for my portion of the talk. I'm going to define the current role of surgery, provide evidence for expanding surgery to, to more broadly to patients, and, and discuss new technical advance, advances, which Dr. Donahue alluded to um, my interest in robotic surgery. So there are a number of ways you'll see, you'll see this talked about a lot. There are a number of ways we classify um, neuroendocrine tumors. We, we talk about it by location. We talk about it in terms of functionality, hormonally inactive or active, differentiation, and then treatment. And depending on the location, functionality, and differentiation determines that green bar there, the treatment, surgical, medical, or regional. And this, again, you'll see often, um, it was presented earlier, uh, I present it again today because our surgical therapies are mostly focused on the well-differentiated well differentiated group of patients. Um, we, we sometimes do surgery for poorly differentiated uh, patients with neuroendocrine carcinoma, um, but uh, less frequently. So this is kind of a, a current treatment algorithm uh, defining some where surgery plays a role. Um, really, it's, uh, it's in, so once you're diagnosed here, when it's local regional, uh, meaning it's not metastatic, all those patients will go to surgery, all of them. When it's local regional and it looks like we can do a safe surgical resection, whether it's in the colon or the small intestine or the pancreas or the stomach, all of these places, the lung, um, all of them. When it when it's metastatic um, or has spread to other areas, then we kind of split into different uh, treatment arms or algorithms. Some of these patients will get surgery, um, but uh, often a lot of patients go into other medical management pathways here. Now, surgery is sometimes done for these patients, but um, this is, um, those are the more complex situations that need to be discussed in a multidisciplinary disciplinary way. So these are just some, I just wanted to show you that Nanets um, publishes every you know, few years guidelines about when to do surgery. Again, this, this is just a table from this publication that resection is used for all these, um, the, the primary tumor for wherever it is in the appendix or large intestine or small intestine, resection is almost universally recommended. This is for pancreas, also in the setting of a neuroendocrine tumor in the pancreas. Um, it's almost universally recommended, except sometimes in the setting when it's metastatic. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now briefly, a few slides on providing some evidence for expanding surgery. So this is, a, this is directly from the uh, national, uh, the NCCN guidelines um, for neuroendocrine tumors, and I draw out this line, which is um, recurrent tumors, isolated distant metastasis, previously unresectable disease that has uh, regressed should all be considered for selection. Again, these are things that we look at very closely in our multidisciplinary tumor boards because um, patients who do get these types of surgeries tend to actually perform better, and that's why these recommendations or guidelines have been published for um, the general population of uh, practitioners. Also, one of the other things, excuse me, one of the other things that helps guide our uh, surgical therapy is um, whether patients have symptoms, whether they have functional tumors that are symptomatic will sometimes be more aggressive surgery because that can, surgically, because that can help control symptoms. Um, this is just a large study showing just improved survival in all groups of patients who get surgery um, 
whether it's metastatic or not. This is a large population-based data set. There are, of course, problems with it, but generally, patients do better with surgery. And the next few slides are gonna show very similar things. These are those survival curves that Dr. Kuntz was talking about earlier. Uh, patients who get surgery generally do better. This is another one for, for I was talking about those high-grade patients. Even those patients um, sometimes do better with surgery than without surgery. So again, I think surgery can play a very big role in um, many patients' neuroendocrine tumors. Those other articles were regarding the pancreas. This is regarding small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors. Patients who get surgery, they more often live a, a, a longer life than those who don't get surgery. Very simple. And even if um, patients have advanced problems with their cancer or their tumor and we can't get it all out, there are plenty of other reasons to do surgery, um, like symptom control for an obstruction that can be relieved or to help weight gain or to, or to prevent uh, or manage carcinoid syndrome. Um, surgery can be useful in, in these settings also. This is what I focus a lot on, which is new technical advances um, and, uh, that facilitate safe surgical interventions, again, specifically the robot. Uh, these are all pictures of neuroendocrine tumors on a CT scan. Classically, we do this surgery, the Whipple surgery. Um, classically, I'll show you pictures that this is done with an incision in the, in the abdomen that is, you know, about 10 inches long. Um, the patient, you know, recovers over seven days and they, they do well. Uh, this is um, a tumor there that would be managed with this type of operation. There's the, there's the other half of the pancreas, which is the left half, which we manage with a distal pancreatectomy. There's the tumor there. We would remove the left half of the pancreas. Um, most uh, centers uh, uh, that do pancreas surgery can do this in a minimally invasive fashion, which is, which is good for patients because it really helps uh, uh, their recovery. This is another type of surgery that we do for uh, the pancreas, uh, which is my focus, which is a middle surgery where we remove just the middle portion of the pancreas and we try to save the rest of the pancreas um, so the patient doesn't develop diabetes or other enzymatic deficiencies. Um, and another very small surgery, which is just removing the tumor itself when it's very small. This is often done for um, tumors like insulinoma and things, things like that. So, so what I focus on a lot of is doing this, a minimally invasive surgery. You can see that I, we put in just seven small um, eight millimeter incisions all across the abdomen there. And that's how the whole surgery is done with these, these tiny incisions. Um, I'm going to show you a picture. The next, the next slide is a picture of what it looks like in the operating room. So um, this is the only picture of a surgery. So if you have any problems looking at intestines or anything like that, I would encourage you not to look. Um, but this is what it will, looks like in the operating room. You can see the top half of the, f the, the, the screen there where your hands can get involved and get inside, which is great. Um, it facilitates the surgery. The surgery is done well that way. That's, uh, tried and true and, and works very well. And then the, the bottom half is, is what I try to do for most of my patients, which is this robotic surgery where um, the camera is magnified. Um, the, you can see the, um, these arms are controlled by the surgeon uh, operating. And then postoperatively, you know, this is just the cosmetic appearance, which is, you know, not critical, of course, um, but we tend to think that the recovery from the surgery is just a lot less um, with these small incisions. This is the, our multidisciplinary surgical group, the surgical oncologists that deal with this at UCLA. Um, just to show my support to Dr. Donnie, who is the chief of surgical oncology, who I work with and is one of my close friends and collaborators. Um, and, and I'm going to hand over now the next portion of the talk to Dr. Agopian, who will talk about the management of uh, when it becomes more advanced. What's the Hi, good morning, everybody. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, my only disclosure is that I don't do minimally invasive liver transplantation, which 
which Dr. Gerges talked about uh, in the last few minutes. But in all seriousness, in the very ambitious next eight or ten minutes or so, I want to focus on the surgical management of patients, uh, particularly with hepatic neuroendocrine uh, metastasis. Uh, now, in the way of background, neuroendocrine tumors, as we've heard, are really quite rare compared to, say, colorectal cancer, which is the prototypical disease that we treat with uh, liver resection in the face of hepatic metastases. But despite it being rare, it really is a challenge for two main reasons. One is that the majority of patients with neuroendocrine tumors uh, present with metastatic disease at the outset, at their diagnosis, and a lot of these metastases involve the liver, which impacts the prognosis. And the second, especially in the field of liver resection, is that evidence-based practice strategies, as we've heard, are really pretty rare, and uh, we mainly rely on a lot of data from retrospective series in terms of uh, how best to manage these patients. Now this slide here summarizes the uh, sites of the primary neuroendocrine tumors uh, that we encounter most uh, frequently over here, and you can see the associated incidence of liver metastases. Uh, as you see over here, uh, the small intestine and pancreas account for the majority of the neuroendocrine tumors, and that, okay, and uh, they also have the highest incidence of associated liver metastases, and perhaps this is not too surprising if we look at the venous drainage of tumors that arise in these sites. You can see tumors in the pancreas drain through the splenic vein into the portal vein, tumors in the intestine drain through the superior mesenteric vein into the portal circulation and directly into the liver bed, and this is why we see such a high incidence of liver metastases in our patients. So the classification of neuroendocrine tumors has been talked about. It could be confusing. It's gone through numerous iterations over the last several years. Uh, but suffice it to say, patients with the well-differentiated low grade one or two tumors with low mitotic counts and the KI-67 index, which we'll hear about over and over again, this is the nuclear proliferation rate. It basically is the measure of how quickly the cells are dividing. These are really the patients we focus on in terms of liver resection, and these are the patients that are going to derive a benefit from liver resection. Unfortunately, the patients with the high grade, poorly differentiated tumors and high KI-67 indices, they may have other options, but usually we don't help them uh, with metastatectomy uh, in the context of liver metastases. So to focus on the surgical therapy for metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, there's really three major broad categories. We have the curative intent treatments uh, with liver resection and in, in selected cases, liver transplantation. And then perhaps a little bit more controversial is cytoreductive therapy. What that means is we're basically trying to reduce the tumor mass in the liver with no aim really to get all of it, if you will, but it's we're trying to minimize uh, the tumor burden in the hopes that it will help patient symptoms and in some cases improve their survival. So in order to determine what the best surgical therapy is, we really need to classify the extent of the liver tumor burden. Now, there's multiple ways uh, to do this, but one of the classification schemes that's been popularized uh, was published by Frilling. So patients with Frilling type 1 lesions essentially have one tumor involving one side of the liver, or predominantly only one lobe of their liver is involved. Patients with Frilling type 2 lesions have predominantly one side of the liver involved, but may have some satellite lesions on the contralateral side. And patients with type 3 lesions really have involvement of their entire liver uh, with tumor, and these are really not the patients we're going to be able to help with surgical resection, at least. So to frame the discussion of liver resection for neuroendocrine metastases, let's consider a patient. This was a patient of mine. He was a 41-year-old gentleman who presented with a several-year history of flushing and diarrhea. He ultimately was worked up and was found to have an elevated urinary 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid level and serum chromogranin A. Uh, the imaging studies with the CAT scan revealed a 3-centimeter tumor in the ileum and multiple right-sided hepatic metastases, all of which were positive on the net spot study. So here is a picture of a CT scan. You can see these are the axial cuts where we're cutting them transversely. And as we come down, right over here, you can see this bilobed lesion high up in the dome of the liver and the back of the right side of the liver. And as we continue to go down, you see some more lesions in the posterior right lobe. This is the ileal primary down uh, in the right lower quadrant, and this is in looking at him up and down, what we call coronal sections. And again, once again, you see multiple right-sided, uh, posteriorly situated liver tumors close to a large branch of the right hepatic vein uh, draining the right side of the liver. So this is the only picture I'll show you guys, or 
one of one of only few pictures I'll show you guys. So this patient was uh, taken to the operating room actually by Dr. Donnie and myself, where he, he underwent a combined resection of both his primary ileal tumor, and we did a large posterior right hepatic resection. This is a branch of the right hepatic vein going into the right hepatic vein. So we basically removed that entire posterior surface of the right lobe of the liver. You can see the bulge of one of the tumors. So these are some cross sections. This is the high up bilobe tumor that you see. These are the other tumors more posteriorly. And essentially, as far as we know, at this point, he's disease free. There is no evidence of any disease left anywhere else. So what's, what's the data to really support such an aggressive rep, uh, approach? Because it is an aggressive approach. So this slide here really summarizes some of the largest single center series looking at the outcomes of liver resection for patients with metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. And you can see, again, that for well-selected patients with low-grade tumors, the five-year survival is really quite excellent, and probably better than anything that we see that we cut out of the liver that's metastatic, which is for sure. Um, and over here, so this is another study uh, basically from a recent practice guideline showing a pooled analysis of outcomes, and you can see that, comp that if you have any kind of re liver resection, whether it's margin negative or even margin positive, even if you don't get all of it, if they were thought to be a good candidate, they do much better than patients that don't get resection, and this is true actually for patients with both pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors as well as intestinal carcinoid tumors. But despite the really excellent overall survival, as we've heard in patients who undergo resection for neuroendocrine tumors, resection uh, following recurrence really seems to be the rule rather than the exception, with only slightly lower recurrence for patients with intestinal carcinoid tumors in their liver compared to patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and significantly less recurrence we see in patients who undergo a complete, complete resection compared to patients undergoing an incomplete or margin positive resection. We've heard about this before. Another very important prognostic factor that predicts outcomes following uh, liver resection includes the KI-67, or that nuclear proliferation index. You can see that the long, uh, excuse me, I don't know how to go back here, but uh, there we go. So you can see that the outcome, the long-term outcome for patients who underwent liver resection with a KI-67 of either less than two or between three and 20% is really excellent. Out to 15, 20 years, you get a very excellent survival. Similarly, patients with the poorly differentiated tumors, as we said, we don't really tend to help those patients uh, with liver resection. So based on all these data and all these mostly retrospective studies, the current indications for liver resection uh, for patients with metastatic neuroendocrine tumors include those patients with low grade one or two tumors with the low KI-67 indices. They should not have any evidence of either non-resectable or non-treatable extrahepatic lesions, and in whom we anticipate essentially a margin negative resection and leaving them with a, enough functional liver. Contraindications for liver resection include diffuse liver metastases, those filling type 3 lesions that we talked about that involve both sides of the liver extensively, and certainly patients that have untreatable or unmanageable extrahepatic tumor involvement, peritoneal involvement, and the patients with the high-grade, uh, high KI-67 lesions. So cytoreduction, which is reducing the tumor mass, is a little bit more controversial for neuroendocrine uh, tumors, but we can consider this and select patients. We use resection or thermal ablation or a combination of resection and ablation in the operating room, and the benefits of cytoreduction is that not only does it slow the tumor growth and select patients, but we can increase the period of time that patients are free of disease. Now, it should be noted that uh, Neuroendocrine tumors are unique because really cytoreduction doesn't play a role in any other, most any other GI malignancy, but in neuroendocrine tumors, we really can and should consider cytoreduction in patients who have a very low KI-67 index and in patients where we anticipate that more than 70 to 90 percent of the hepatic tumor mass can be resected or ablated. Again, this is not a curative intent procedure, but it will improve quality of life and prolong survival in select cases. Finally, let's talk about liver transplantation. This is not a therapy that necessarily uh, everybody vouches for, but I'll show you some data. I think to frame the discussion, I'll focus again on another one of our patients. This was a very young, otherwise healthy 35-year-old female who had presented with a two-year history of some nausea. She ultimately underwent workup, first with an ultrasound and then a CAT scan, and she was found to have a four-centimeter lesion in the tail of the pancreas. She had an endoscopic ultrasound at the time that found one liver lesion, a nine by seven millimeter, very small in the left lobe that was biopsied and also consistent with metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. The rest of her metastatic workup was negative. She did not have any disease in the chest. And at that time, this was a number of years ago, 
We didn't have the net spot exam. She underwent an octreotide scan, and the primary tumor was lighting up on the octreotide scan, but not any of the liver lesions. This is her CT scan. Here's her pancreas. As we scroll down, you can see this large mass kind of invading out of the pancreas and the distal pancreas, and then we have a discontiguous large two centimeter node anterior to the pancreas and the peripancreatic fat. And as we scroll through the liver, we're gonna see, again, these are very subtle, as oftentimes they are. You see one lesion here, this is what was biopsied in the left lobe. This is on a different phase of the study, and you can see maybe a few other lesions. So we thought this patient primarily had a pancreatic tumor, nothing else going on in the liver other than a few spots to take care of it. So the patient was taken to the operating room uh, with the intent of removing all her disease, we did do a distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy, but unfortunately she was found to have innumerable small lesions studded all over the surface of the liver and throughout the liver. And this is something that we actually oftentimes find in patients with neuroendocrine tumors. I always expect to find more than I see on the scans, no matter what the scans are. Uh, but in her case, she had a lot of disease that we didn't feel we can surgically appropriately address. She recovered very well. Her pathology was very, very favorable. She had a low grade one tumor, low mitotic index. The KI-67 was less than 2%. So we thought that this was a young patient with unresectable liver disease that may benefit from liver transplantation. And in fact, she was placed on the liver transplant list. And the process of that is a little bit nuanced and complex. But after two years of waiting and getting some exception points, she ultimately underwent liver transplantation at our center. She's now about five years out of transplant and is disease free and is doing very well. So, okay, what's the data for liver transplantation? Again, maybe a little, much more scarce, certainly, than liver resection. But again, these are some of the largest single center series and some of the registry datas that show an excellent long-term survival can be achieved. And again, we've got to focus that these are patients with innumerable bilobar liver metastases that we don't think are resectable. And in some of the more recent series and in well-selected patients, even up to 80 or 90 percent, I think if you take all comers, it's probably more close to 60 to 70 percent five-year survival. And again, we're talking about patients that otherwise had no other options uh, for their liver. So this is really uh, quite good. So what are the prognostic factors for how patients do following transplantation? Once again, we see KI-67. This is from one of the smaller studies. You can see the patients that were transplanted with a KI-67 of less than 5 percent, at least in this study, at excellent long-term survival. All of them had survived up to 10 years, again, in this particular study. Uh, other studies looking at other factors that are important, intestinal primaries, for some reason, tend to do better than pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors undergoing transplantation. Younger patients tend to do better. And a lack of hepatomegaly, that means the liver is very enlarged, and a lack of prior resection are positive uh, predictors of good outcome. And I think that is because these serve as surrogates for the underlying tumor biology as well as the, over, uh, over, uh, the tumor burden. And finally, and this is an important concept that's true in any of the cancers that we transplant, is that patients that wait longer prior to receiving this therapy actually do much better than patients that wait a very short period of time. And this could be counterintuitive. You think, well, if I wait longer, it's going to spread somewhere else. And it's actually not the case. And the reason is, is because neuroendocrine tumors grow slowly as it is. And so when you actually rush patients to transplant very quickly, you don't have time to observe their tumor biology. And more importantly, you don't have time to basically observe clinically occult or undetectable lesions on scans that may be there. And in the setting of immunosuppression would actually even grow faster. So what we don't want to do is we don't want to transplant the patients that have disease outside of the liver because their growth can be accelerated in the setting of post-transplant immunosuppression. And so the longer we wait and show stability in the liver, the better the chances that they're going to do very well following transplant. So in summary, based on this data, the indications for liver transplantation as we currently see them are patients with unresectable by low bar involvement of the liver but have well-differentiated grade 1 and 2 lesions whose venous drainage is primarily into the portal circulation. Uh, and who have demonstrated stable tumor disease. We say here at least two months, if not six months, but even the longer the better. Uh, and contraindications to liver transplantation include patients certainly with extrahepatic disease and in patients who have poorly differentiated tumors uh, with high KI-67 indices and high grade. So with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.